Okay, thank you for your patience this morning as we got off to a rocky start. Sometimes I feel like giving myself a pep talk like a football coach, like we had a rough first quarter, but, you know, still have a lot of time, pull it together, and everything will be okay. All right, um, today we're covering loose ends with PHP. By the end of the week, the PHP quiz will be available online. And uh, so I want to spend a little bit of time reviewing for the PHP quiz. I, first, I want to, here, here's my agenda. David had a question in lab, and I want to talk about it so everyone hears the answer. Echoing with array elements. How to do that. Because, again, a um, little, little bit different than just a plain echo. Number two, global variables. They are handled differently in PHP than virtually any other programming language. So they're worth mentioning. I want to talk about your next assignment. Or... Actually, the assignment is due today, so I don't know if you call that your next assignment or what. So, lab due today. I want to review for the PHP quiz. And then, an intro to Ajax. Alright, so that's our agenda today, and however far we get, we get, all right? So, first issue, printing with an array element. Now, we haven't talked about arrays much in this class, but many of you that have done programming in other languages are aware of arrays and how arrays are a list of elements. And PHP has arrays like any programming language does, or virtually every programming language does. The problem comes in when you try to echo or print an element from the array using the magic quotes. Remember how the magic quotes work. If I were to say in my block of PHP, echo the value of i is value of i is dollar sign i with the magic quotes and again the magic quotes being the double quotes dollar sign i is a variable let's say the echo is going to output that message with the actual value of i in there. So this would output the value of i is 12. So it's a nice little feature of PHP that allows you to format your output nicely. In a lot of other programming languages, you have to concatenate literals and strings and all that. This kind of handles the concatenation for you. And if I had two variables, it would work too. So if, for example, I said the value of i Sign something, 
the dollar sign triggers it to say, hey, this is a, um, this is a, a, a variable. And only within double quotes it does that. But it tells it this is a variable, pull in the value of the variable here. Now the problem comes in is if you have an array. An array has a list of values, and an array, with an array, you specify which number of the elements you want. So for example, if I were to say dollar sign i equals 1, dollar sign array sub i equals 15, and then I were to say echo or we'll add something onto it, we'll add some text onto it. quotes get confused. All right? The magic quotes get confused because it thinks you're talking about two separate plain old variables and not an array with a subscript. So it's going to try to print i and oh sorry, a and i and a is an array, it really doesn't know what to do with that and it's liable to give you an error. All right? So this, as it is, would give you an error. The answer is to put curly brackets around it. If you put curly brackets around it within the magic quotes, that tells the PHP server, tells PHP and tells the server, hey, treat this like a unit. All right? So. It's not two separate variables, it's one variable, a subscripted array. Okay? So, that's that question. Another question that springs to mind with echoes. What if I wanted to print out a dollar sign? Or curly Pardon me? Or curly, or curly brackets, for that matter.
variables are handled differently in PHP than in any other programming language that I'm aware of. With variables, you always have a question of scope. And when I talk about scope, I mean where that variable can be seen, where that variable can be used. If I'm in JavaScript and I do something like this, global equals 10, that is declared outside of a function. All right? That's just declared within sort of the main line of the page. If I declare a variable outside of a function in JavaScript, it becomes a global variable, which means I can use it anywhere within functions. And so that would be legal. That's JavaScript. All right? So within Java, and that's the way it is in Java, that's the way it is in C Sharp. If I declare something outside of functions, it's considered to be global. It's considered to be used anywhere within that particular file. PHP is exactly the opposite. If I declare a variable in PHP, is not assumed to be global. Therefore, if I had a statement like this, it would assume that global was referring to a local variable within the function. Let me change this around a little bit to make more sense. I set a value of global as 10, call function ABC in JavaScript. That sets the value of global to 12. This global and this global point to the same variable. That truly is a global variable. Therefore, when I come back and do an alert in JavaScript, it's going to give me a value of 12. It'll pop up, bing, value of 12. In PHP, if I declare a variable, set it equal to 10, call this function, by default, this does not relate to the same variable I've declared up here. It relates to a local variable within this function called global that just coincidentally has the same name. So if I call that function in echo global, I'm going to get 10 because this variable and this variable aren't the same variable. Now, how can I make it so that it's a global variable? You need to put a declaration in the top of your function saying global and then the name of the global variable. If you do that, then PHP knows that this and this are the same variable. And you'll get
get the value of 12 outputted. So it's almost like they, the, the PHP and JavaScript have opposite assumptions. If you declare a variable outside of a function in JavaScript, it's assumed to be global everywhere. If you declare a variable outside of a function in PHP, it is not assumed to be global, and you have to explicitly say that it is global. Now, to muddy the waters further, all right, if I declare, explicitly declare, a variable called global here, then that becomes a local variable. When I change it to 12, that variable and that variable are not the same, and then this would come up with 10. Now, as a general rule, a lot of these difficulties can be say uh, can, can be spared yourself uh, by simply avoiding global variables. Global variables are problematic because they can be changed anywhere, and therefore you can write a function that changes something that you weren't aware of the implication of it. For example, if I were to create a JavaScript file that declared a local variable, and I put that in an external JavaScript file, I could accidentally overwrite that variable in a function that I wrote because I didn't realize that it was declared as a global variable if I didn't look at the inside of the JavaScript file. So as a general rule, you want to avoid defining global variables. Again, avoid. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say never, all right, but avoid. How then do you get variables into functions that you want to use? You do it via arguments of the function. So if I wanted to pass in a value of a global variable, I'd make an argument to the function and call it and then return the value. That way I know exactly what's happening. I'm giving it the value, I'm taking the result of the function and putting it somewhere else. All right. Okay, moving merrily along. The lab for 3.30, do we have any questions on that one? Okay. Where I did use uh, the array format to kind of split the answer up, so to speak. In other words, uh, uh, I know a return technically returns just one thing. Right. But I was able to implement an array so I could kind of bust it into three parts upon its return for displaying each part okay. separately on the page. And I, I mean, I got it working and everything. I, I okay. And, and that's, that's a good question or a good comment. If I'm understanding you right, you have a method that returns, instead of one amount, it returns an array that contains three amounts. Um, it essentially returns uh, the, the residency, it returns uh, the, the credits, and it returns the uh, tuition, and now I can handle each distinctly and separate on the... And how does it return that? Um, as an array, right? Yeah, okay. Array. So it doesn't return an array of the three tuition amounts. It returns an array of the credit hours of, of that and that. And that should be fine, all right? And that's an alternate approach to do that. What, what you can do is you can simply then, you can format that output however you want to. All right? So it's not... You don't have to do it that way, but that's a way, if, if, if it seems reasonable to you, then that's, that's a good way. Uh, the reason I probably wouldn't do that 
is because I know whoever calls a function knows the residency status that's being set and knows the number of credit hours. So to return those back to the function that calls it is kind of, uh, kind of doesn't make sense. All right. Oh, I, I did it for the, for down the road in case I wanted to do uh, calculations or multiple calculations that return multiple answers. And, okay, um, but still, but still, even if you're returning multiple answers, all right, um, you will um, always, whoever calls that function will know the credit hours and will know the, um, will know the um, residency status. I think I had a student that was coming in, so let me go and open the door, lab door for them. And you folks are welcome to go back to lab after this. So I'll be back in one minute. problem specifically for a couple of reasons, all right? One is I wanted you to use include files, all right? Sometimes, in fact, I may do it, I may do it this semester. Sometimes I say later on in the term, do an Ajax version of this, all right? And if you did the lab that's due today correctly, doing an Ajax version should be a piece of cake. All right? Why is that? Because the point of this is not to just get the right answer, but do it in a way that the function is a good function, and by good function I mean it, it can be reused. It can be used in other ways. So, for example, in this case, what are the ingredients of the function? The ingredients of the function are the residency status and the hours. So those should be the argument to your function. What should the result be? Well, again, David took a different approach, but at the very least, the, the return value of the function ought to be the tuition for that particular um, that particular combination of residency codes and credit hours. If you do that, then it doesn't matter where the data comes from. In the case of the calculator where you have a form and you enter the data into the form, you get the data that the function needs from the arguments, you call the function, and then you do something with the results. In the case of the table, you simply call that function three times for every table row. One for in, state, or in county, one's for out of county, one's for out of state. And then in turn, you put those results in the table. You display them in the table. So if your function is good and it isn't tethered to the page that's calling it, then you can call it from a variety of different pages. You can get the input from anywhere, and you can do anything with the, the output. So later on, when we go and do an Ajax version of this, ought to be a piece of cake. We have the function that is generic that can handle this. We simply need to be able to write a little script that gets the data from wherever the Ajax requests get data, plugs it into our functions, and then does whatever the output of Ajax results are. And again, we'll learn how to do that in upcoming weeks. If you do that correctly, 
just as if you've done this lab correctly, you only have one calculation for the credit hours that lives in only one place. And if you need to change something about it, if you need to change the, the, the algorithm, like maybe they're no longer giving 13 through 18 credit hours the same value, or maybe the tuition rate goes up, or whatever. If you've done it correctly, you ought to only have to change it in one place. And that, that's the goal. So in other words, when we get around to doing the Ajax version of this, your other code should still continue to work. Just like in this lab example, assuming you first did one, like the first did the calculator and then went and did the table, after you get the calculator going, when you go to do the table, the calculator part of it should still work. And the table should use the same code of that. That's such a fundamental topic or concept in programming. And it's very simple, but it's one that I don't think can be emphasized enough, right? This gets into a statement I make in most of my classes about how it's different to simply get the right results versus writing a good program. All right? There's a million ways that you can get the right answer, have your page display the right output. Of the million ways, there's probably a lot less ways that's a good way to do it. And what's the criteria of good? All right? This isn't, this is something that mainly isn't subjective. So in other words, it isn't good. It's not that I say it's good, so it's good. All right? Or that's the way I would do it, so that's a good way. And every other way is a bad way. What's good about it is how maintainable the code is. If something changes, what do you need to change? So you can almost do that as a mental exercise and say, what if the tuition goes up $20? What do I have to change? And if it's like, well, I have to change one function, then you probably did a good job. If you look and you say, well, I have to change the tuition rate here on this page, and I have to change it on this page, and I have to change it on this page, then you probably didn't do a good job. So that's like, that's objective. That isn't like my preference. That's clearly better. All right? If you have the code in one spot, you're going to make sure it's consistent. And you're going to make sure it's easy to update. Other questions or comments about this assignment? Formatting as currency. Let's take a look. And this is a case, again, of one of those things that should I know off the top of my head what that function is? Yeah, maybe I should. All right. But you can't remember everything, especially when you deal with multiple languages. In any given week, not to sound like a martyr here, but in any given week, I'm doing stuff in C Sharp, PHP, JavaScript, <laughs> Java, and Objective-C. So yeah, I, I'm willing to forgive myself if I can't remember how to do a currency conversion in one of those languages. In practice, what happens is if you focus on one language, the things that you do often, you'll remember. And the things that you don't do so often, at least if you can look them up. So in a case like this, I'm going to assume there probably is a function. Maybe I'm going to find out I'm wrong. Maybe there isn't a function to do this. But I'm going to assume, yeah, there's probably a function to do it. And I'm just going to use my detective skills to go out and look. One thing, I don't know if you technically call it currency format, but it, this addresses the rounding the two decimal 
right. Points is that number underscore format. Okay. Uh, I mean, technically, if you tweak the number, you can get a currency format. Just yeah. How many places you want to go after the decimal point? I, I, I find that intriguing, so but I'm always open to other alternatives. It's always comforting when you see within the top four. Looks like there's a method called money format or not. Money format does not exist. Oh, here we go. Formats a number as a currency string. Now, the nice thing about this method, it would be a little different than, than what you specified, is this would do the formatting based on the server's settings for currency. For example, they give an example down here of if you were in Germany, you would format euros with a comma instead of a decimal point. The role of the common and the decimal point is reversed. And using the set locale method, you could format it a couple different ways, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, to David's point, there also is a number format, which kind of does the job as well, where you can specify a number and you can specify the number of decimal points and it will format it. I'm not sure if that rounds or not. Without arbitrarily rounding up our course. Let's look up PHP round. Okay, there is a PHP round method as well. One trick that you can do in almost any language to round is multiply by 10 to however many digits that you want to round to. So if you want to round to the nearest two digits, multiply your number by 100. Add 0 0.5 to it. Convert to an integer and then divide by 100 again and that'll make sure there's only two digits and it'll be rounded. So that's a little trick. If, if you can't remember the round function, you can always do that one as well. All right. Next, PHP quiz. PHP quiz will be like the other quiz in that it will be available online second half of this week so probably Wednesday or Thursday. It'll be very similar in format to the Java string, or Java, JavaScript quiz, which I aim to get to grading very soon. Pardon me? Still up there, yeah.
be similar to the JavaScript in the sense that there will be sort of concept-related questions and there will be coding questions. The concept questions will be questions that I think I can't tell if you understand it simply by looking at your coding. For example, why you might do a particular piece of functionality server-side versus client-side. Well, you could write all the code that you need to write in six different languages. I can't tell if you understand the concept or not unless I ask you why would you do it in one versus the other. So there very well could be a question like that. What is something I would do on the server side and why I would do it on the server side? So there's those concept related questions. The coding questions will be short answer in the sense that I'm not going to ask you to write a whole page or a whole program. I'm just going to ask you to write a few lines of code. So a question might be, and it'll be like JavaScript, where I'll give you the HTML of the form, for example, and I'll say, hey, this form submits to process.php. What is the what are the instructions to grab off the query string the value for miles and multiply it by three dollars or you know three and give me the cost of filling up your gas tank or something like that and then display the answers so you won't have to write a whole page but Given a form, I'll ask you to do some sort of processing. What would be the server-side scripts to do this? And it's very focused. I, I aim to do that for a couple reasons. First of all, that doesn't sort of put you in double jeopardy. In other words, if I give you a whole program to write, all right, um, if you can't get past the first part, you can't really do the second and third and fourth and fifth part. And that's kind of not fair. If you don't understand one part, you know, it's going to mess you up for the whole portion of this test. So each one of these questions is meant to be, be, meant to be able to answer sort of standalone. So in other words, if you have absolutely no clue how to do question one, you should be able to do question two. At least that's my aim. That's my rationale for doing it this way. Ought to be the same format as the quiz for JavaScript. Do we have any questions for this? All right. One thing that's difficult in this class is the way the prerequisites are structured is difficult for me to know beyond some basic prerequisites how many of you, for example, have had database? All right. So I think you've all had database, but there's other semesters where students don't have. You know, I get students in here because I think the only prerequisite for this class is the HTML class or the C sharp class or C sharp and HTML, right? So it's unfortunate that I cannot make database stuff part of this class. I guess I could, but it would be difficult. That being said, if we were going to cover one more topic in this, we would cover PHP and relational databases. In other words, how I could take a listing of customers and output the results. I'm willing to entertain the idea of giving you extra credit if you do an assignment that does database interactivity. Doesn't have to be elaborate, but maybe pulls the values from a database and displays them on the page. Or does a search function, whereas you type in a search and it gives me a list of products that match what you search for. That would actually be a good one. So if, you're, if you want to do that, um, 
not that hard. You can more than likely find some examples online that you just will need to adapt to do that. But that would be a good way to expose you to that, even though we don't really have time or uh, to you know time to discuss this con uh, concept in more detail. And I may do a similar option later on when we get to Ajax. That might be a good thing to add on to one of these projects. All right. Last topic today is Ajax overview. We'll, we'll, we'll likely review this in more detail on Wednesday. But Ajax is a different way of doing things. It's not a new programming language. It's simply using the languages of a web of the web in a different way. And I'll talk about traditional web applications or standard web applications meaning the basic way that we've been doing scripting up to this point in the semester. The basic way we've been doing this, this scripting this far in the semester is that our server-side scripts and our client-side scripts serve different roles and they interact sort of in a clunky way. What do I mean by clunky? I mean that if I request a page from the server, the server side script runs in, in its entirety, creates an HTML page, and that HTML page gets sent back to the client. Part of that HTML page that gets set, sent back to the client might include some JavaScript. And that will allow the users the ability to do some interactivity. But anytime we need to use a server again in traditional web applications, we make a request and get back an entire page. All right? That's clunky, right? It's an all or nothing thing. In a traditional web application environment, when we make a request to the server, we get back an entire page. All right. In Ajax, we do a different sort of interaction. Here's a great example of an Ajax. Whereas if I start typing, I get the top four search terms for the characters that I've typed in, and I get it immediately. In other words, I'm not getting a whole new web page. I'm not getting a brand new web page. I'm only getting, well, we'll talk about what I'm getting. But I can tell I'm not getting a brand new web page because if you look on the status bar, that status bar isn't moving. You know, when I go and I make a request to the server and I get a whole new web page, normally it says it's waiting for the server or whatever. Just like when I load up Google for the first time, well, that happened kind of quick, but in a slower environment, you'd see, hey, it's loading the Google page. This is something altogether different. This looks like client-side scripting, right? Why does it look like client-side scripting? Because it's not requiring the entire page to be redone. Remember when we talked over about the mouse over menus, we were not redoing the whole page, all right? When we were displaying the coins, we were not going in and redisplaying the whole page. We are just changing a part of the page. So this looks like client-side scripting is at work here. However, what part of this does not look like client-side scripting? Well, 
It has to access a database to pull the most common search terms that start with PHP space, PHPD, PHPDAT, and so on. All right? That's something that we haven't seen done client side. Client side scripting has been used for simply manipulating an existing web page. Going out and doing the heavy lifting, that is interacting with the web server, is a job for, the, for a web server. All right? Accessing databases is a job for the web server. All right? So, if we sort of do some thought experiments on this, we can sort of determine that something's up here that's different than our traditional model of the client asking for a whole web page and getting back a whole web page. We are asking the server not for an entire web page, but we're asking the server for some data. Specifically, as I type in letters, I'm asking the server for the top four search terms that start with those letters. All right? And then I can select one of them, or I can continue typing to narrow down my search further. That's a server thing that requires database interactivity and all that. And yet, the results get displayed seamlessly as though it was done in a client side. So Ajax is a different style for the client and server to interact. Not through the traditional model of the client asking for an entire web page from the server and then the client side code manipulating that page, but it's working on a model where the client asks the server for a piece of data, just a little piece of data. In this case, a list of four items that are the most common search results. The client, then, is good at manipulating web pages. So once it gets the data from the server, the client can take over and format the page to reflect the new data that it got from the server. So in Ajax pages, the client doesn't ask, doesn't always ask for a new page. Sometimes it just asks for some data. And then it takes that data and revises part of the web page without having to redraw the whole web page. Notice as I type here, this is the only section of the page that changes. This doesn't change, that doesn't change, doesn't need to change. All right? That's what Ajax is. How do we accomplish that? That will be the topic on Wednesday of this week. All right. Any questions? I will open up the lab if anyone wants to go back to lab and continue. Um, if not, we'll see you on Wednesday.